places. Hi guys, in this video we will go through Ian Fitzgibbon's defence speech delivered by Professor John Cooper. Ian Fitzgibbon was one of the five men charged with the murder of Ashley Dale, along with the possession of a prohibited weapon and ammunition with the intent to endanger life. Ashley Dale was shot with a submachine pistol in her own home in the early hours of August 21st, 2022. The prosecution believed Ian Fitzgibbon, alongside Niall Barry, James Witham, Joseph Pierce and Sean Zeiss, conspired to kill Lee Harrison after obtaining the automatic pistol, but Ian Fitzgibbon was cleared of all charges. So let's take a look at Professor John Cooper's defence speech on behalf of Ian Fitzgibbon. We're going to go through every last drop of it. We're going to work out exactly what the prosecution say Ian Fitzgibbon did. Even now, after many weeks of trial, after two separate speeches, it's hard to work out what it is they're saying Ian Fitzgibbon did. How did he organise, motivate or monitor? We will look at the evidence calmly, analytically, coolly and see where the prosecution case goes. Let me make something very, very clear indeed as far as Ian Fitzgibbon is concerned and anyone else is concerned in the trial. If the prosecution have proved their case so you are sure, you will convict them. I'm not flag waving. I'm not a flag waving. I'm not on a campaign. I'm no friend or otherwise of Ian Fitzgibbon. I'm here to do my job. My job as a defence advocate is to help you look at the prosecution evidence, analyse it carefully, make arguments where we think the prosecution evidence is weak, and then you cannot rely on it and leave you to do the difficult job. The twelve of you mull over what you said and come to a just and proper conclusion. If a person is guilty of this heinous allegation against Miss Dale particularly... Oh, Cundine. Whoever is found guilty, and I include my client, deserves the most condign of punishments. I'm not here to whine and wail to you. What if this and what if that? I too am a citizen. I too walk around in the streets, go into shops, eat, drink, have mates. I too want to feel safe in my community. We are all individuals and members of the community. We are not flag wavers for any situation which puts the community at risk. What we are here for is to look at the evidence the prosecution presented to see whether they have proven his guilt. The prosecution bring this allegation. The state bring these allegations against the citizens. And they were going to have to do it to a very standard. Satisfied so you are sure. If God forbid any of us were charged for something we had not done, me, anyone on this side of the court, you, your family or your friends, you also have the protection that if the state makes the allegation against you, if the weight of those powers of police and forensic science, the prosecution, are brought against you, you too have the right to say it must be proved. It must be proved so that the jury are sure. What level do we have to get to so we are sure of Mr Fitzgibbon's guilt? What if you say to yourself, I've heard quite a bit of it. Mr Greeny is very persuasive. The boxing had nothing to do with it. Mr Fitzgibbon is guilty. What have you said that to yourself? Mr Fitzgibbon is probably guilty. As a matter of law, probably guilty is not guilty. Probably guilty is not guilty. Even if you are at that level, and we submit that when we finish analysing it, the evidence cannot sustain that. But if you say probably guilty, then it's not guilty. What if you say we have deep suspicions about Mr Fitzgibbon? Why did he go to a posh restaurant? I'm not quite sure what the relevance is, and we'll come back to that later. But this posh restaurant in Dubai, I have suspicions about him. You'll be ahead of me already. If probably guilty is not guilty, deep suspicion is nowhere near the level you need to get to being satisfied so you are sure. That's a high standard the prosecution have to achieve. Not suspicions, 
not probably, but something much higher than that. Satisfied so that you are sure. Our fundamental position is that there is no way the prosecution have achieved that level. Such that they know it, the grand speculation seeps into the prosecution case as the trial goes on, never born out of the evidence. Apparently, Mr Fitzgibbon was contacting Mr Witham or others about cigarettes. Absolutely no evidence to that. We will come to other examples as we go on, such as depression. Such is the desperation. We enter into the world of fantasy. Whatever your views on the defendants, we stand alone. Ian Fitzgibbon stands alone. He stands alone in this trial more than any other defendant's charge on substantive counts in this trial. There is clear blue water between him and the others, which are encapsulated with the Glastonbury situation. When you hear the prosecution's submissions that they're all at the beck and call of Mr Barry, if the prosecution case against all of those defendants is that they're at the beck and call of Mr Barry, where does that place Mr Barry? Who of all them stands out with the allegation now of Grassim? The dangerous allegations of grass against him. If Mr Greeny is right, they all did the binding for Mr Barry. Then they are excluding clearly the evidence we would submit to you, Mr Fitzgibbon, because he clearly doesn't. I want you to consider how many other situations have arisen in this trial which show Mr Fitzgibbon as a separate entity, absolutely personified by the fact that this man who is a central organiser, a monitor doesn't even wait for the two foot soldiers to come back. It's tempting to leave it there. There's much more to it than that. On that little introduction I've given to you, it shows how the prosecution, even in their own case, even using their own words, that people did what Mr Barry said. Fitzgibbon didn't. Fitzgibbon now is labelled a grass, and that is serious. The organisers waited for Mr Witham and Mr Pearce to return. It's the Crown's case, their words which I'll repeat to you. Mr Witham and Mr Pearce say the Crown return to their flat at Pilch Lane to report to the organisers. They're the Crown's words. You know whether they be organisers or not. Mr Fitzgibbon had left. Our submission is based on might Ian Fitzgibbon be right. Might Ian Fitzgibbon's case be right? You'll see straight away I'm using the word might. Might is all the defence need to establish. The defence need to prove nothing. The prosecution bring their case and the prosecution must prove it. If any defendant establishes that what they say might be the case and you are of the view it might be the case, not even that is the case, that is not guilty. Defendant establishes that what they say might be the case, and you are of the view it might be the case, not even that it is the case, that is not guilty. Ian Fitzgibbon, like all defendants, was not obliged to give evidence. Defendants can, and you've seen it in this trial, perfectly properly sit in the dock and say to the prosecution, prove it. Mr Fitzgibbon decided to give evidence. The point I'm labouring is that particular issue of might. If you are of the view, after your careful deliberations, that all we have put to you in relation to Mr Fitzgibbon might be right, then we submit that is not guilty. Only if you discount what he says out of hand and you are satisfied so you are sure of what the prosecution says. Despite the prosecution saying the return was to the organisers and Mr Fitzgibbon had gone by then. If you are still of the view the prosecution have made their case so you are sure, then you convict him and don't give it a second thought. I'm not giving any namby-pamby wishy-washy submissions to you. You have carefully, consciously and assiduously applied yourself to this trial, focusing intently on what is going on. Your analysis will be a close and careful analysis. What I submit to you, given your approach to this case, will shine with you. So what is a prosecution case against Ian Fitzgibbon? It's been a tough job. Firstly, we know what can't be their case. Presence. Pure, mere presence. At Pilch Lane. 
even for the considerable period of time in itself, it is no indication of guilt. I'm not going to speculate on the Kershaw situation, but as an example of law, mere presence clearly cannot, of itself, be indicative of guilt. Otherwise, you'd be seeing Mr Kershaw. That, that in itself is no indication of guilt. The Crown say things go much further of guilt. A mention of Count Two, conspiracy to murder Lee Harrison, that needs an arrangement to kill him and let the killing be carried out. The Crown had to establish that Fitzgibbon had an agreement with the other defendants, or some of them, to kill Lee Harrison, and Fitzgibbon intended that killing be carried out. Nothing I have to say to you takes away the tragedy of this situation, the appalling loss. It wouldn't be human if it didn't affect us as professionals. I don't want you to go away thinking anything I submit is in any way indicative of not understanding that loss. When one hears Miss Dale's voice, I cannot comprehend what that has been for her dignified family who have had to sat throughout this trial. I'm not going to begin to speculate. To hear her voice, I will say it, was heartrending. But we have to, have to put emotions to one side when we do this job. You will be required, not asked, as members of the jury to equally put heartfelt and right-thinking emotion to one side and analyse the evidence clinically and carefully. Emotion, right-minded emotion in the law courts and particularly the juries is a hindrance to just a verdict. Whether it be guilty or not guilty, it is no disrespect to anyone who lost their lives. You could say it is respect. At this point, Professor John Cooper draws up an analogy between a juror and a surgeon. He says, imagine you're a surgeon carrying out an operation. You would not want them to become emotional. You are the professional judges of fact. You are drawn from different sections of the community. What draws you together is a degree of professionalism, coolness, analytical minds looking at the evidence and seeing whether the prosecution have proved their case. I know you are well up for that. The argument goes on. Should we have juries, or shouldn't we have juries? They are the bedrock of our criminal justice system, the absolute fundamental of the criminal justice system. The dock in our jurisdiction is quite an unusual thing. In many jurisdictions, they don't have docks. The perception can be there are guilty people behind it. There's an argument the dock should be abolished. But that's an argument for another day and another place. Have an open mind. Just because the police chose to arrest people, just because they're put in that dock behind screens, just because they're charged and their name appears on an indictment, doesn't mean each and every one of them is guilty. Sometimes in the net that is swung by the police or the prosecution, it digs deep. It's our submission that that is particularly relevant when it comes to Ian Fitzgibbon. Open minds, clinical, unemotional application to your job. Analyse the evidence. Your first point of reference is the undisputed position between every single party in this case. That mere presence at Pilch Lane is not enough for guilt. There needs to be agreements for conspiracy, count two. I'm going to ask you to use your common sense of life to place into that intention the prosecution case. That Ian Fitzgibbon, that those he was in a conspiracy with, would kill Lee Harrison and on the prosecution case, in count one, kill Ashley Dale. On the prosecution case against Ian Fitzgibbon, it's that he intended to kill Lee Harrison and intended to kill anyone that might witness it and therefore, by logic, by going to kill Lee Harrison in Ashley Dell's home, Ian Fitzgibbon intended that she would die. That is a prosecution case against Ian Fitzgibbon. You will apply those strictures to all defendants in this case. I particularly want you to apply them to Ian Fitzgibbon. How does the prosecution satisfy you so you are sure? Bear all that in mind when it is suggested that Ian Fitzgibbon intended the death of Lee Harrison, intended that Ashley Dale be killed, 
Does that fit with what you know on the evidence about Ian Fitzgibbon's lack of motive and lack of feud? The question on top of everything else is this. Has the prosecution proved to you, so you are sure, that sometime after Glastonbury, where Ian Fitzgibbon had the incident with Mr Barry, and August, barely two months later, he turned into a bloody and callous murderer? It's clearly not the prosecution case that that's what he was at Glastonbury June 2022. Yet the prosecution are asking you to accept, so you are sure, that in approximately two months, Ian Fitzgibbon turned into a bloody, callous, notorious murderer. To do so, they say, it's either because of Dusty or because of a fallout with Olivia through Sean's Isk. Even if it was, and that is a weak suggestion the prosecution are putting forward to you, that turns Ian Fitzgibbon into a bloody callous murderer. Those are two reasons put. You treat Ian Fitzgibbon as you treat all the defendants separately and individually. There is a clear blue water between Ian Fitzgibbon and the rest of the defendants. A clear difference. Clear blue water. Dividing line on motive. Dividing lines on where the prosecution say the turning point came. With us, the prosecution say the feud goes more dramatically. Something happened in two months to turn him from what he was at Glastonbury to what they suggest he was approximately two months later, whereby he wanted Ashley Dale to die. In two months, despite the fact there is clear evidence, we submit that that was beyond any of his wishes. There is a categoric evidence to show that Mr Fitzgibbon and Miss Dale were friends. It is put to you on everyone's case that when Miss Dale knew that Mr Fitzgibbon and his girlfriend came to Glastonbury, she was pleased. It's things like that in the heat of the battle are lost. Things like that where it is clear Miss Dale and Mr Fitzgibbon had a decent relationship. Why else would she be pleased that he was coming to Glastonbury? We require of you, in the politest way, to separately deal with the defendants. Particularly take care with that dividing line with Mr Fitzgibbon. The prosecution are trying to find a reason why Ian Fitzgibbon after 10 years of friendship with Lee Harrison, should become centrally involved, and that's the Crown's case, centrally involved, in a plot to kill Lee Harrison and any other witnesses. The prosecution say it's because of Dusty, because of Olivia. We say on that, no. Even at the height of the prosecution case, even if he did have an issue with Dusty, even if he did have an issue with the Zeisk and Olivia situation, does that turn him into a notorious murderer? A notorious murderer of his friend Lee Harrison and equally of his friend Ashley Dale. This dispute which is denied between him, Dusty and Olivia and all that situation was enough to drive him into all this carnage. That's the Crown's case. The Crown are saying to you, that's what happened. We want you to accept our argument that Ian Fitzgibbon turned into this callous killer in the space of two months despite 10 years of friendship between Lee Harrison and he was a central part of organising and monitoring that process to ensure that Harrison died and that Ashley Dale also died. Where, members of the jury, is there evidence for that? As far as Ian Fitzgibbon is concerned, where is the evidence of any of that? Apart from the fact he was in the house. He was in Pilch Lane, which is not enough evidence. Others were as well. The evidence is communication and some poor attempt at trying to create a bridge or a feud for Ian Fitzgibbon, Olivia and Dusty. If the Crown can't rely upon those two instances, then they are completely out on a limb as far as this defendant is concerned. Interesting also, isn't it, how the Crown are perfectly content to treat Ian Fitzgibbon at a significant time at Glastonbury as a virtual prosecution witness, relying on him as a witness of truth on what happened at Glastonbury between him and Mr Barry. Perfectly happy to put Mr Fitzgibbon to you and ask him questions as if he was a prosecution witness on the point, accepting what he says as absolute truth. The Crown can't have it both ways. He's either the cruel callous killer or he's someone they're relying on as one of their witnesses. In many respects, by treating Ian Fitzgibbon as one of their witnesses, 
Isn't it ironic he's the only member of the public who's given evidence for the prosecution? The only member of the public that stood in the witness box and told the truth at Glastonbury for the prosecution. There's some irony in that. When the Crown are putting Mr Fitzgibbon very highly indeed as the killer, this organiser. The background, as far as Mr Fitzgibbon is concerned, is important. He asked for the jury to look at the photographs showing Ian Fitzgibbon, Lee Harrison, Sean Zeisk and Ricky Warnick. The first ten photographs actually come from Miss Dale's phone, says John Cooper. One could take from that that Miss Dale was there at the time, taking photographs. Lee Harrison and Mr Fitzgibbon. In earlier days, no doubt, but that's important. There is Lee Harrison and Ian Fitzgibbon there in the younger days. This is a man the Crown are suggesting in two months Ian Fitzgibbon became a killer of, or the attempted killer of. Page 11 has Dusty on it, and others. It shows Mr Fitzgibbon, you might think, associating with members of the Hillsiders. There's Mr Fitzgibbon not acting with or performing acts for, but simply cross-border friendships. We see the photographs on page 15, 17 and 19, and so on. Page 21, there is room being booked for Mr Fitzgibbon and his girlfriend Daisy. It's in there to establish that when Mr Fitzgibbon went to Glastonbury, he didn't go with a gang of lads. He went and booked in reservations with his girlfriend. He wasn't looking for trouble. The undisputed background is that Ian Fitzgibbon had been a friend and even a close friend of Lee Harrison and Ashley Dale. If that isn't enough, let's go to some agreed facts. Agreed fact 35. There are photographs of Ashley Dale's handset showing Ashley Dale, Lee Harrison and Ian Fitzgibbon socialising together. Not just bumping into each other, socialising. That's an agreed fact. The Crown aren't just agreeing to being on the same photographs. The Crown aren't just agreeing within the same room at the same time. The Crown accept the word socialising. Not meet, not bumping into, not being in the same room, not being at the same event. Ashley Dale, Lee Harrison and Ian Fitzgibbon socialising. A man on trial for murder. If he did it, let him be damned. Our submission is... Not in any crazy, namby-pamby way. The evidence just isn't there. How can it be that the person socialising with the very people he must have known he was going to be part and parcel of killing? You are, in dealing with Ian Fitzgibbon, with a mechanical man, that's a Crown's case. There's no middle range with him. Unlike others, and there's a clear blue water again, it cannot be suggested to the level with Ian Fitzgibbon. In the photographs you've seen, he's one defendant who's so close that on agreement with the Crown, with Lee Harrison and Miss Dale, his conversation on the road to Damascus to kill her is the most graphic. Because all of the defendants in this case, he on the proven evidence, was, and we would say, remain the closer and the closest of all friends of Lee Harrison and Miss Dale. The about turn to Crown need you to make to turn Ian Fitzgibbon into callous murderer is the most acrobatic of turns. We would submit that any jury had been asked to achieve in many a long day. And that's the end of the first part of John Cooper's defence speech for Ian Fitzgibbon. The next day, John Cooper says, I'm going to spend the rest of my time going through some of the evidence we touched on and put the flesh on the bone. I'll start with one reminder. You judge the case on the evidence, not prosecution suggestions, not even defence suggestions. What are the prosecution case theories as to why it was Ian Fitzgibbon did what he did as far as Lee Harrison is concerned and Miss Dale? It's either because of Dusty calling Ricky a grass, which contributed to his tragic unaliving. No evidence, by the way, why Ian Fitzgibbon turned into this monster they allege. If you don't like that, what about Olivia and Sean Zeiss? Remember, Olivia, his cousin, there was a fallout with Sean Zeiss. Do you really think, whatever the rights and wrongs of or that, it's nothing to do with Ian Fitzgibbon? Do you really think, as realistic members of the community, 
that is enough to turn a person into the sort of person Ian Fitzgibbon is said to have turned into. The sudden Jekyll and Hyde, which they say affected Ian Fitzgibbon over a period of months. It was not because of any problem Ian Fitzgibbon had with Lee Harrison, whether it be Olivia and Sean Zysk, whether it be Dusty. It certainly wasn't on the evidence, because there's no evidence. There is no evidence of any problem Ian Fitzgibbon had with Lee Harrison. The feud, to whatever level it was, did not involve Ian Fitzgibbon. It was nothing to do with Ian Fitzgibbon. It cannot be said Olivia plus Dusty equals Ian Fitzgibbon wanting Lee Harrison and wanting Ashley Dale dead in the process. One or both of those equals guilty and motive. If the Crown are right, that motive is important to understanding, to unlock the door as to why people acted in a certain way. We say they are right. Look at the motive the Crown have put to you as far as Ian Fitzgibbon is concerned. It shows no motive. Moving on to Glastonbury. The events of Glastonbury 2022 are important. We'll have to decide whether Ian Fitzgibbon is telling you the truth about what happened at Glastonbury between him and now Barry. Ian Fitzgibbon is separate towards all the others charged. In that, there is no evidence to suggest at all that Ian Fitzgibbon would do the beck and call of Mr Barry. That's the prosecution's case. If you take the prosecution case that Mr Barry is a person with whom organisers and those involved did the beck and call to, you have the clear blue water between Ian Fitzgibbon and the rest of the dot. Because Ian Fitzgibbon does not do the beck and call for Mr Barry. We know this because of the words of Miss Dale. There's a message on June 23rd. Ashley Dale to Olivia McDowell. Responding to a message in which she is told Ian Fitzgibbon is coming to Glastonbury. Yay, fab, see you soon. Miss Dale is pleased that Ian Fitzgibbon and his girlfriend are going to join them. No beef, no feud. If there was a feud between Ian Fitzgibbon and Lee Harrison, Miss Dale very sadly would know about it. The prosecution rely upon the words of Miss Dale as evidence against the defence. We are being referred to her words. Poignant. Well, if the prosecution say you can rely on Miss Dale's words in that way to support their case, so you can rely on Miss Dale's words in the same way if they support Ian Fitzgibbon's case. The prosecution can't have it both ways. They can't say, here we're referring to Miss Dale's words, and you should take them as a direct of your thought. Then, what she says about Ian Fitzgibbon and Dusty, you should doubt. The important thing here is that when there is a dispute between Ian Fitzgibbon and Mr Barry, you can take it that Ian Fitzgibbon is telling the truth. There is no evidence of any agenda that Ian Fitzgibbon had at all. He was at Glastonbury with his girlfriend. The suggestion of agenda is simply plucked out of the air without any evidential foundation whatsoever. Throughout this trial, lots of suggestions, lots of innuendos, lots of guesswork, and pitifully little evidence. The crux of this is that Mr Fitzgibbon has told you on oath that Mr Barry came up to him at Glastonbury and says, have you seen Lee Harrison? Showed Mr Fitzgibbon a knife and says, if you see Saz, tell him I'm going to stab him up. You heard what Mr Barry said about that. He didn't show a knife and say those words directly to Ian Fitzgibbon. Ian Fitzgibbon said, no, I'm not going to follow the script on this. I'm going to tell the jury the truth. You're going to have to decide who you believe. If you believe Ian Fitzgibbon, it does give you some direction you're dealing with a witness telling the truth without fear nor favour. Mr Barry says, no, I didn't show the knife. No, I didn't speak to Ian Fitzgibbon. Let's look at the evidence to assist you that Ian Fitzgibbon is a witness of truth. Perhaps at grave risk to himself. Being called a grass is not a good thing. Also, to establish the relationship Ian Fitzgibbon had with Lee Harrison and Ashley Dell at the time. Going back to the central point, it goes right to the heart of our submission. Ian Fitzgibbon is not just a man with no axe to grind. He is a man who is friends with Lee Harrison and Ashley Dale. It is incredulous that that change should take place. Is he telling the truth? 
When Mr Fitzgibbon was telling you about seeing the nine, withdrawn from Mr Barry's trousers or pocket, you may have noticed Mr Fitzgibbon was standing, thinking it through and visualising it as he showed you. A witness of truth thinking carefully about what he saw. He told you he saw it near the stage by the wire fencing. He was very detailed in what happened and what he saw. He is not prepared to lie as far as Mr Barry is called and is not prepared to help the prosecution if it's a lie. The prosecution showed him photographs of a nine. How easy would it have been if Ian Fitzgibbon was putting the boot in for Ian Fitzgibbon to agree with the prosecution and say, that's the knife? A lying witness would do that. It's an easy thing to do. Mr Greeny is going to be pleased with the answer. Mr Fitzgibbon says no. I can't be sure that is the knife I saw. I can't be sure that is the knife I saw. Does that not tell you there is a witness trying to give the right evidence? Not, oh yeah, that's a knife. No, said Fitzgibbon. I'm not sure that is the knife I saw. Mr Fitzgibbon is a witness of truth. If you think he is a witness of truth, or might be a witness of truth, this helps you on whether you can rely on him as a credible witness. He might not be giving the answers the prosecution want, but he is given truthful answers. If you have the view he might be truthful here, you are also driven to the conclusion he might be truthful throughout his evidence. In the messages, Miss Dale gives her number to Claudia to pass on to Ian Fitzgibbon at Glastonbury. Miss Keeper says, Here you have Miss Dale giving her phone number to someone she knows will give it to Ian Fitzgibbon. What does that tell you about the relationship, the friendship, the trust that existed between Miss Dale and Ian Fitzgibbon? Look at the vibes of it, of the communities between Mr Fitzgibbon and Miss Dale and Mr Harrison. Doesn't it feel and sound very different from other communities you deal with in this case? There is a very big difference between the interaction and dynamics between Ian Fitzgibbon, Lee Harrison and Miss Dale that make Ian Fitzgibbon stand out as being different when it comes to the consideration of this trial. They then followed WhatsApp messages between Ian Fitzgibbon and Miss Dell's phone, supposedly used by Lee Harrison, trying to arrange a meet in the festival. Then there's Ashley Dell's voice notes, in which she says, Obviously on the weekend, when they're in the same fezzy, and he's saying where Saz, I'm going to stab him up, you're Ian. There is clear and supportive evidence on the concern and communication that Ian Fitzgibbon had to make sure Lee Harrison knew that he was at risk from Nal Barry. All this beyond any doubt in our submission shows you that Ian Fitzgibbon is telling you the truth about what happened to him and Mr Barry at Glastonbury, backed up again by the words of Miss Dale. There are text messages from Ashley Dale which refers to Barry pulling out a big knife to Ian Fitzgibbon and saying where Saz is getting stabbed up. Perfectly supportive of what Mr Fitzgibbon says, Mr Barry says all this is wrong. He didn't pull out a knife and say the words are suggested he did say, that Saz was going to be stabbed up by him. There is Miss Dale repeating what she was told. Supportive of the truth and credibility of Ian Fitzgibbon. Another message in which Ashley Dale reports that now Barry was taking the piss out of Lee and found it all off Ian. Ian Fitzgibbon is informing Lee Harrison things were going on which he would need to be aware of. All of these communications indicate the truth and honesty of Ian Fitzgibbon and how separate he is of the general group in this particular matter. He has volunteered to you his previous convictions. He is no angel. That is not an unusual thing in the criminal courts. It doesn't mean every time the police arrest you, you've done it. But it's right that you know. There is no evidence. There is no violence conviction against Ian Fitzgibbon at all. You know the community in which he mixes. You know the world he's told you about. Drugs. Ample opportunity if Ian Fitzgibbon was the type of person to commit violence, to have been called for it and punished. He's not even been swept into it. Where there is little positive credit to be argued, is it possible for you to give him a little credit for not getting involved in violence? But it goes further than that. When you consider the prosecution's case theory 
that in two months, this man became the killer he became. He has no record of violence. It is not in him. You'll look at those previous convictions and you'll consider what he said. I'm not supporting drug dealing. It is abhorrent. I'm not asking you to even like Ian Fitzgibbon. That's not necessary. I don't have to like him. We're not here to like Ian Fitzgibbon. You're not here to like him. You're here to analyse the evidence. The previous convictions assist you. All his previous convictions, he's pleaded guilty to. Every single one of them. On a few occasions, he's been before the court, he's pleaded guilty. You know all there is to know in his interactions with the criminal justice system. There is no mystery. Nothing that you don't know about him. We want that to be the case. It is our decision on his behalf to let you know. He needn't have done so. He wasn't forced to produce his previous convictions. The prosecution couldn't have cross-examined him on his previous convictions. You found out purely and utterly because we decided to tell you. We have nothing to hide. We want you to know Ian Fitzgibbon. We argue it helps you to work out the sort of man that you are dealing with, all about him. Yes, he was carrying a knife at Glastonbury. Yes, he did suggest to Lee Harrison that that knife was there if he needed it to defend himself. He told you why he carried a knife. He had a scar on his head from a knife attack previously. He confronted someone who attacked his sister. He's got a scar on his head to prove it, and therefore carried a knife. I'm not condoning that. I'm not saying it's right. When you consider Ian Fitzgibbon, you have an idea of the real world he lives in, his experiences, and to a degree, he kept himself out of the criminal courts in relation to violence. The Crown's case is, he is an organiser, keeping careful watch on the progress of these killers, the progress of the foot soldiers, to see what's going on. The reason they say Witham and Piers returned to Pilch Lane after the killing was to update the organisers about what happened. This is a Crown's case. To update the organisers about what happened. That's a prosecution case. There's a trend here, isn't there? It's quite rare a defendant advocate is standing in front of you and using the prosecution words to support the defendant's case. What does that tell you about the strength of the prosecution case when we're saying, yes, we agree? If they are right Mr Witham and Mr Pearce returned to Pilch Lane after the killing to update the organisers, one assumes the organisers will be waiting for the update on the prosecution case. You're ahead of me, aren't you? I can see some of you nodding. Fitzgibbon had gone and Fitzgibbon had left. Fitzgibbon wasn't hanging around to be updated. On the Crown's case, clearly not an organiser, because on their case... Witham and Piers were returning to update the organisers. Not the organisers, minus Ian Fitzgibbon, who left and was home by one o'clock. The Crown sidestep, don't they? If Ian Fitzgibbon was the organiser they suggest, the monitor they suggest, on such a serious and deadly enterprise, why did he leave? Furthermore, it's not just that. If he was part of the organisation when Witham and Piers came back to the Crown's case, why don't they contact him and say, where are you? Where have you gone? Nothing to suggest he was required to be updated. Nothing to suggest there was any concern or worry when he'd gone. No contact from the others to say, where are you? No evidence to suggest that Mr Fitzgibbon was leaving any of the others in the flat and said, wait a minute. Witham and Piers have just committed a very serious offence. They've gone out to kill Lee Harrison. Where are you going? Fitzgibbon said, I'm going home now. That's a prosecution case. They have no answer to it. When I repeat it like that to you in real language, not law book language, real words, the crime the Crown suggests had just been committed and Ian Fitzgibbon knew the crime was about to be committed. Lee Harrison was going to be slain and anyone else that witnessed it would be killed. Did he just leave, not wanting to be updated, how it happened? That's the Crown's case. With him and Piers returned to update the organisers. If they did, Mr Fitzgibbon clearly wasn't an organiser. It doesn't make sense. Where are you going? I'm going home now. 
You'll come to your own views on that. One thing is for sure, Mr Fitzgibbon is not interested one way or the other about what happened, mainly because he didn't know what was going on. Ian Fitzgibbon left Pilch Lane at 45 minutes past midnight. Piers and Witham didn't arrive back until 45 minutes later at 1.25. Mr Fitzgibbon was at his home. He was home, possibly in bed, by the time Witham and Piers arrived back. He doesn't even, and they don't even, try to contact him to see where he's gone, to get an update, nothing. The first thing Mr Fitzgibbon knows about the tragedy of Miss Dale is when Claudia tells him the following morning. Look very carefully at the communications. All the communications associated with Ian Fitzgibbon are on his own personal phone. No special secret phone. On his own phone. All of the communications that were achieved or not achieved were during the currency of the fight, the boxing game. At 18 minutes past 10pm, where are you? Are you coming back? I thought you were interested in the boxing. At 23 minutes past 10 pm, with him to Mr. Fitzgibbon. 23 minutes past 10 again, you see it there. Mr. Witham again at 23 minutes past 10 and 6 minutes past 11. One second. 6 minutes past 11, one second. 7 minutes past 11, one second. All of these effectively during the lead up or actual boxing. Does this look like a man centrally engaged with the organisation and monitoring of the actions? of the so-called foot soldiers. It's not much, at the very least. It's all during the currency of the boxing. Those are the communications on which the Crown on the night suggests that Ian Fitzgibbon is monitoring and organising. This is significant evidence to support the case of Ian Fitzgibbon. Organising and monitoring on the night. There you have it. What else then are the Crown pushed upon? The feud. The sudden conversation on the road to Damascus in two months. The communications and organiser. We submit none of these things pass muster. What's the next thing? Let's go to the funeral of Ricky Warnick at 10th Street. Let's try and construe what Ashley Dale is saying about things that happened there. To put the magnifying glass on Ian Fitzgibbon as if he was the only person there. There are over 100 people at this weight, including the defendants, Mr Fitzgibbon's sister, Mr McKay, Mr Witham, Mr Piers and Mr Barry. What the Crown say happened, there is a complete and utter speculation. You have been addressed on whether Ian Fitzgibbon was there when a firearm had been discharged. There's nothing in what you've been told to suggest others weren't there as well. Look carefully at what Miss Dale says. She's not saying... They were alone on their own. There were others there. Groups there. It was something that happened. Whether Ian Fitzgibbon was there or not, it would be wrong to interpret that he was there on his own with another. There's nothing to suggest there weren't a whole lot of people there when that happened. The prosecution take a magnifying glass to him, magnifying what he's done. We all know if you take a mag glass away, Suddenly the picture gets wider. They're magnifying in on Ian Fitzgibbon, ignoring what's going on around and about him. There are over 100 people at this weight. The rest is speculation. There's no evidence that Mr Fitzgibbon was involved in any way with the purchase of the Hyundai because he wasn't at all involved in that. There is no evidence Ian Fitzgibbon was involved in the activities in Wales. Ian Fitzgibbon is at home, smoking weed, Nowhere near Wales. When you come to consider issues relating to the Hyundai and Wales and the Kyle line, that's a totally different set of evidence that may or may not relate to other defendants. It certainly does not have any relevance whatsoever as far as Ian Fitzgibbon is concerned. The more I go on, the more this funnel narrows and narrows and narrows. The prosecution are churning evidence into a top wide part of this funnel. Shovel the evidence into the funnel. Right at the end comes a drip of liquid that comes through the filter, come through the gauze. That's a prosecution case against Ian Fitzgibbon. Shovel it in and then funnel and see what comes out at the other end. What comes out is nothing more than a little drip of distilled water. 
It's that little drip that I'm spending this time with you on. I make no apologies for strongly urging upon you the lack of evidence here. What do we get? Speculation. We go on to picking sides. He didn't pick sides. He had friends on both sides. Liv says to Miss Dale, you'll have to pick sides. Well, you don't. And Ian Fitzgibbon didn't. Maybe he did stand in the middle. Either way, whether he picked sides or not, he was certainly not on the side of any feud Mr Barry or others may have had. And now I want to touch upon the final strand of evidence as far as Mr Fitzgibbon is concerned. The evidence afterwards, to buy. There's one very important piece of evidence the prosecution just can't deal with. They haven't touched upon it. And it really is a key which unlocks a case as far as Ian Fitzgibbon is concerned. We submit all the other matters do. But this is a revealing thing. It deals with Ian Fitzgibbon's state of knowledge. On the Crown's case, he is the organiser. He is a motivator. He knows what's going to be going on before it happens. He's right there, knowing what's going on, knowing Lee Harrison is going to be killed, they hope, and all witnesses. Fitzgibbon knows it and is central to it and is an organiser of it. And Fitzgibbon knows what has happened that night or expects it to have happened. If he did, why doesn't he book a flight to Dubai that night, that morning? The following morning at least. Why is it that when he booked a flight to Dubai, it is one hour after Zeisk and Barry visit him the following morning? Ian Fitzgibbon, for his sister, allegedly books a flight to Dubai an hour or so after his conversation with Zeisk and Barry the following day. Now after that, and on the morning he's first told by Claudia that Ashley had been shot, that is so important as a key opener in this case as far as Ian Fitzgibbon is concerned. If he had known or suspected, and if he would have done on the Crown's case what had happened on that night, that flight to Dubai would have been booked the following day. It would have been booked that night. It wasn't booked because Ian Fitzgibbon didn't know the tragedy that had occurred that night. It blasts open the prosecution's case, which was already on shaky hinges to nothing. Central to the prosecution case is that Ian Fitzgibbon was an organiser was a monitor, knew what was going on and was going to be reported back to by Witham and Pierce. He did not know what had happened until Claudia had told him that morning, and particularly until Mr Barry and Mr Zeiss had visited him at his home. Mr Barry said, they're going to be knocking on your door. This is a vital piece of evidence. The flight is booked on August 21st at 28 minutes past 1pm. Please note that time. This is critical. At 28 minutes past one, you know on the undisputed evidence that Mr Barry and Mr Zeiss visited Mr Fitzgibbon's home between 11.30am and 12.30 that morning. This flight was booked within an hour of that visit. You might have wondered why I was keeping to develop the window of the visit of Mr Zeiss and Mr Barry to Mr Fitzgibbon. This is why. This is why, because Dubai is booked barely an hour later. You couldn't write it in some sort of crime film. Why on earth is Mr Fitzgibbon booking a flight to Dubai then? Because it's only then that he knew what had gone on. He wasn't reported back to. He wasn't an organiser. He didn't know what happened. Otherwise, that flight wouldn't have been booked an hour after Mr Zeiss and Barry put the details on what Claudia Fitzgibbon had told him that morning. Yes, he panicked. He was afraid he'd get drawn into something he wasn't involved in. He was afraid he wouldn't be believed. Because he's been with these people. He only knew the majority through Mr Zeiss. He hardly knew Mr Barry. He only really got to know Mr Barry over a few months before this happened. Mr Fitzgibbon is afraid he's going to be drawn into something, as he has been. Worried he might be called a grass. Worried about his mother and his sisters and fled, like he said, like a coward. A fearful coward, he fled. I ask you to take from Dubai those two crucial pieces of interpretation. The booking of the flight shows beyond any doubt whatsoever an hour after seeing Mr Zeisk and Mr Barry. It's the first time he knew the enormity of what happened. 
the crown's case completely evaporates into that tube. He panicked and fled, for the crown to desperately show a photograph of him in a posh hotel. What's the relevance of that? It was a birthday of his sister in Dubai. That's all the prosecution know. Fitzgibbon isn't smiling in it. Are the Crown really reduced to that? Putting you to a snapchat on August 27th? What is irrelevant, we submit, is the utter desperation of the prosecution. They think they need to show you that photograph at a posh restaurant, as if that is going to twang your emotions, that you can have a meal at a posh restaurant. You might think you need more respect than that. It doesn't help you in the slightest. It only helps you by indicating the prosecution's complete and utter desperation. The enormity of what was happening dawned upon him as Mr Barry and Mr Zai spoke to him. This is a serious matter. It's a serious matter for Mr Fitzgibbon. But just as much, it's a serious matter for those who tragically lost Ashley. The crime was a tragic, appalling crime. The guilty people should be convicted. But those where the Crown have not proved the case against them, or got nowhere near, it's just as much justice for Miss Dale that they are acquitted. The justice in this case for Miss Dale and the community is that those who commit this offence are found guilty, but it's just as much justice for Miss Dale that those who did not are acquitted. We ask you, on the analysis we will undertake, to find that Ian Fitzgibbon is not guilty on all these counts. And that is the end of Ian Fitzgibbon's defence statement.